Welcome back to the show, everybody. Good to see you've returned for yet another round. I like to see that. So, yeah, we are continuing on with the Farmall H tractor series rebuild, sorry, diagnosis, repair, and reassembly of the starter and the generator. But you may have noticed I've been titling these last few episodes a little bit differently to try to reach a broader overall audience uh, with some of these very common types of uh, repairs because Delco Remy provided starters, generators, regulators, just electrical equipment in general to loads of different manufacturers back in the day. So even if you are not a red tractor aficionado, all of these steps here that we've been going through will still apply to your machine if you've got the Delco Remy equipment. So uh, that said, the prior episode, we went through the um, testing, verification, and reconditioning of the armatures. That wasn't too difficult at all, and that was probably the most complicated part of this whole process. What we are going to do today will be simpler still. So once again, back to the bench. We can move the verified and reconditioned armatures off to the side so that we can open up some space in the center to start looking at the cases, all right? And the field coils down inside. Some people are awfully intimidated by these pieces here. Rest assured, there's nothing here that uh, really can pose much of a problem at all. It's all highly serviceable if you just know what to do and what to look for. So we will use the digital multimeter once again, set to the ohms scale, zero outer leads. Yes, same reading as last time, so we're good to go. And you don't even need a high-end one of these. The cheapest on the market will perform these basic tests with the same level of accuracy. You may also be wondering why I have not removed the field coils or the pole shoes from the cases yet. Well, the first test that we need to do requires them to be in the cases, and that will tell us whether or not we need to remove them, at least right off the bat. So. Uh, what we want to do is make sure the coil windings are completely insulated from the steel case. We do not want to have any continuity between the coils and the case. We want them to be completely separate. We can check that at two points. We've got this F terminal lead where it sticks through the case. We've also got this um, field coil lead that attaches to the third brush. We'll test it at both of those locations. So one lead on the terminal that sticks out of the case, the other one on the case itself, and you can see we have an open circuit. All right, just to verify, yes, that would be good continuity. That is no continuity, so that is good. Just to make sure, I will hook one lead onto the terminal that comes from the field coil to the case. Once again, nothing. So we know that in all likelihood our coil wrap is still in good condition because we don't have any sort of continuity to the outer case. We'll just do this real quick with the starter. And we will want to check the main power lug to the case. We should have no continuity, that's good. And we've got this lug on the inside. You can see it right there. We will check that to the case, good. And by proxy, the other one should be good as well. We'll test it anyway, lug to case, all very good. So back to just the generator again. Now that we know the field coils are not shorted to the housing, the other test that we need to do is to verify the integrity of the field coils themselves. In other words, how well will they function? So in a perfect world, everyone would have the factory test equipment that would introduce a very specific voltage through the coils and then you would watch to see where your amp meter needle ended up and you would have a concrete test result. I'll show you the easier way to do it. We've got a digital ohm meter and we have all of the test specifications in this manual. Two episodes back, we determined that this generator aligns with test spec number 1778. In this spec, you have field current of 6 volts should yield a result of 2.5 to 2.72 amps. Using that information, in conjunction with Ohm's law, we can determine how much resistance we should find measuring through those field coils 
with the plain Jane ohm meter. So Ohm's law states that resistance is equal to the voltage divided by the amps. So our six volt input on the low end of the scale, 2.5 amps would yield us 2.4 ohms resistance through that coil on a good coil. And the higher end of the spec, we have our six volt input, 2.72 amps, that gives us 2.2 ohms. So we're looking for somewhere in the low two ohms range. So one lead goes on the F terminal, the other lead goes on the brush terminal. We are testing through both field coils at once and we get an even two ohms on the meter. And that is close enough to our desired 2.2 to 2.4 ohms, calling this one good. And with everything testing good here, I have no reason to remove the field coils or the pole shoes. It's best to leave them right where they are. But the reason why we want to see that type of resistance in a generator field coil set has to do with their construction. So I've got this field coil I've pulled from a different unit and I've peeled some of the coil wrap back to expose the, uh, the wire that's on the inside. And this is one continuous piece of wire. It just comes in the one side and it wraps around and around many times before leading out the other way. And this is coated with a non-conductive insulating finish, all right? Because you want to force the electricity to have to make all of those revolutions and follow that entire length of wire before it goes out the other side. That's what creates the field. If they did not coat this wire, electricity would not go around and around. It would say, oh, I always follow the easiest path. So instead of making all these loops, I'll just jump from strand to strand to strand and then finally exit out the other way. And then the field would collapse and the generator would not work. So in the event that some of our tests failed, possible causes could be coil wrap that had given up, allowing these strands to short out or ground out directly against the generator housing. Or if we had low overall resistance, we could have a field coil set that possibly had been overheated at one point and started melting the insulating finish off of the wire strand, allowing voltage shorts to bypass the majority of the field coil itself. In that case, then we would have to take the field coils and the pole shoes out of the housing. I've done that on our old generator core here, and it's pretty simple. All right, here's the field coils, the pole shoes. This is a pole shoe. It's the, it's the piece of iron that's in the center, and we have a paper um, layer between the, uh, the shoe and the field coil itself, but they're just held in by these tapered head machine screws. All right, uh, one bit of advice, do not try to remove those without a screwdriver that fits the slot properly. Don't try to use one that's too small. These are very tight because of that tapered head. Also, if you have trouble getting these to crack loose, I've found if you just gently with a very small torch tip, heat just the tapered head portion of the screw and then attack it with the screwdriver again, most times it will crack loose and then spin right out with ease. Um, you can rewrap these field coils if the just the wrap has started to give up. Um, coil wrap is very similar to cloth friction tape, except it does not have any adhesive on. Um, it just wraps around and around and then the tag end just gets tucked underneath the second to the last wrap and then it's all cinched tight. And then that's how that uh, holds itself all together. So yeah, nothing here too critical at all. Not very complicated. If you just know a few simple tests and how electricity is supposed to flow, everything here is very highly serviceable. Okay, one final bit about field coils and then we will move on. So starters are tested completely differently from generators. Uh, and it's due to the construction being so different. You have to realize generators are producing electricity, starters are consuming it, all right? And in contrast to the generator, you look at the field coils and the starter here. There are four of them with four pole shoes, but look at how heavy the copper strap is that comes out of those field coils for all of your brush contacts for where the field coils are joined to one another. That same flat heavy copper strap is what is underneath that coil wrap as well. So 
Whereas the generator had that really fine wire that made many, many revolutions around the pole shoe. The starter has this heavy, more conductive uh, material that makes fewer revolutions around each pole shoe. And for that reason, starters of this vintage have usually never shown anything for resistance through the field coils. We'll test this one here. This checks through all four and look at that, 0.1. We've basically zeroed our leads. Look at that, no resistance at all. So that doesn't necessarily indicate a problem either. That's just the way these have always been. So the real way to test these field coils is to have the starter back together and have a special test stand where you can mount the starter in it. You can fix the output solid and then just basically full field this thing. Just put the power to it and see how much torque registers at the output and then gauge what your amperage consumption is. We don't have any of that. So I pretty much make sure the coil wrap looks good. The pole shoes are, sorry, the pole shoes are tight and we don't have any shorts um, between anything in here to the case. So that's going to do it for field coils for now. I think we can put our armatures back front and center and we can start assembling some of these pieces. So let's start with the starter. That sounds good. First thing I will do is put a very light coating of grease on the armature shaft. And the first piece to go on that shaft is going to be this disc. It's got a bushing on the inside of it, and that is a graphite impregnated bushing meant to be self-lubricating. I just give it a little bit of uh, backup with my favorite long-lasting grease. Someone in the comment section asked me, what is that grease? CRC Stay Lube brand engine assembly lube with Molly graphite. Personally, I love this stuff. It lasts forever. It does not dry out. It also does not uh, separate, meaning there is no oily substance that will separate out and then start to creep into places where you don't want it. So I, I use this stuff on everything. So the first thing we do is take that bushing hub face down toward the windings. That just slides on like that. Nice spin. Next up is the starter drive. This is an inertia type drive. The design is crazy simple. We've got two hubs. You can see the rear one is separate from the front one. They're only joined by this dampening spring. The rear hub is keyed to the armature shaft. So that one is fixed. The front one is allowed to float a little bit. And the way these work, when the starter spools up, these hubs will accelerate at a much faster rate than the drive gear, and that will walk the drive gear up these warm ramps, all right? That's what engages the drive gear with the ring gear on the engine. Once the drive gear comes up against the shoulder at the end, we are in a steady driving state and we're cranking the engine. Now, once the engine starts, it then will power the drive gear and push it back down those worm ramps, disengaging it from the ring gear. That's all there is, pretty simple. Um, this is a six volt style starter drive uh, matched to the starter. And if you had a 12 volt, starter or we're using a 12 volt battery you definitely want to put a 12 volt rated starter drive in the 12 volt drives have much more robust dampening springs and they will handle that that harder engagement that the 12 volt offers you all right if you put 12 volts to a six volt starter drive too many times you can have this happen we've got this souvenir at the top of the shelf. This was pulled out of the bell housing of Seniors Farmall Super M. And um, it's a portion of a starter nose cone. You see it looks a little bit familiar? Yeah. So this was from repeated 12 volt applications of a six volt rated starter drive. Um, what happens is that gear slams out against the um, shoulder so hard that it eventually comes loose and it pops the end of the nose cone right off of the starter. So if you have a 12 volt system or you upgrade to a 12 volt system, you definitely want to have the proper 12 volt starter drive. Otherwise, bad, bad things can happen. So the key goes in, just like that. And the starter drive or Bendix just slides down the armature shaft. Work to align the key with the slot. There we are. So now we've got that round hole right there. Remember this bolt has a little peg on the end. It goes in that round hole 
and that's what fixes the starter drive in position. You just have to hunt around a little bit, find it. There we are. Align for our fold over lock tab. And fold the tab. You can kind of see some of that, that spring action of this center dampening spring in play. Next up is the nose cone. Once again, I put a little bit of grease up in the bushing on the end of it. So we take the same end play washers from before, throw those on the end of the shaft, and then the nose cone just slides right over the top. There we are. And then our disc ahead of the windings goes into that slot just like that. Tighten the two screws. One right there, one on the other side. There we are. Nose cone should be installed. Good spin, good in play, happy with it. What I'm doing now is applying just a very thin layer of an electrical grease to the surface area of the nose cone where the case itself is going to make contact. Very important to keep these surfaces clean because the end cap is going to need to ground well to the case so that the case grounds well to the nose cone housing so that that all grounds well to the chassis. All right. Um, some people also use graphite in these areas because it's conductive and it resists um, rust and corrosion from forming between those joints. Either method is fine. So we've got our alignment hole right there. We can slide the case on. There's our alignment peg on that. So we roll that around and carefully feed the armature through the case and the windings. There we are. Alignment pegs are located. So for now, that is as far as we go on the starter. So back to the generator once again. The first thing we want to do is load the front of the armature shaft. Once again, I prefer a light coating of grease on there. We'll start with the front bearing housing. I did take it all the way apart because I thought it was worth cleaning it up pretty well. So here's how it goes back together. We've got this felt ring. It's kind of a dust seal. We'll address that in just a minute. And we have this backup washer for the felt ring, a little tab right there, aligns with the oil inlet passage. Helps to prevent that ring from spinning. There we are. Then comes the front bearing, and you can see this is a sealed bearing. So uh, this is an upgrade that I did to this generator the last time through, and I'll explain why. So here's the front bearing plate from our core generator that we've been using for an example. And you can see they originally had open ball bearings in them. So they would rely on that dust seal on the front and then they would put this gasket on the back and then this metal plate over that held everything together. I prefer these sealed bearings over the old open ball bearing. A, because they're going to be a lot more resilient to the large amounts of dirt and dust that are going to be coming off that cooling fan and blasting right into the front of the generator. And B, it turns this into a lubricated for a lifetime point so you can disregard this oil cup from here on out. So the bearing number here is an 87503, very common size sealed bearing. So easy to find. So that will slip right in there. Because it's a sealed bearing, we do not need a gasket under the metal plate. So that can go on and secure it with the three screws. So our bearing plate is ready to go on. Followed by the spacer. The spacer is also what seals against that felt dust ring in the front. Okay. And then we put the wood roof key on for the drive pulley. And then the drive pulley. Line up the key. All right. And we have the lock washer at the front and the nut. All 
All right, so we're looking good there. But for now, we're gonna have to put the housing back front and center because if you remember from the disassembly episode, I found a broken wire on the inside. So what that ended up being was the A-terminal lead. And the A-terminal is the main charging terminal out of the generator. It looks like it just frayed where it soldered to the head of the bolt right there and then finally just came off, just an old wire. So plus we had uh, a little bit of wire exposed right there. You see that shine? That was no good. So all I did was um, splice the uh, the lug end and the bolt end back on a new wire and I surrounded it with some shrink tube as well. So yeah, the, the way all of these terminals go through the hole in the case, you can see it's kind of an oval shaped hole. So it's a bolt, a uh, little bit of a hex head on there and we have these, it, it, it's like they're a plastic insulator. Okay, so the bolt goes through that and it has a corresponding hex that matches the head of the bolt and we've got the two flats there and there that's what keep it from spinning keep the bolt from spinning after we put it into the case so get everything positioned properly here that will go through the case just like that and then we just have another like a plastic insulating washer it goes over the top of it like that all right and then we have a lock washer and a nut run all that down cinch it tight and you'll have a good a terminal lead to hook back up to the brushes again and as always we want to check our work so we make sure our newly installed a terminal lead is in proper shape so first we check continuity of the lead itself very good, I am liking that. Now we make sure that we don't have any continuity between the lead and the case. This is verifying our insulation washers where it passes through. Excellent, it's all looking very good. So that means we can put the housing onto the armature assembly. Once more, I have my electrical grease on that mating surface. There is our dowel hole for alignment. Here's our Dowel on the case, everything looks good. So once again, just gently run everything down over the armature. There's our peg lined up, looking good. Yep, liking it. Okay, everybody, after a slight workbench reorganization, this is all that we're left with. And we're running a little bit tight on time today. That means next time we will get into the brush plates. Nothing much to do there. Pretty simple stuff once again. And then after that, it's just the main case hardware, banding them up and we should have two pretty solid electrical units ready to go back onto the tractor. So like I said, going into it, nothing too complicated yet. This is all pretty much week one basic electrical stuff. So. As always, I hope you found it entertaining. I hope you found it educational. And I hope to see you all back again next time. Thanks again, everybody.